Beloved Church of God, beginning our service before the Lord, let us stand and affirm the promise that relates, that is contained in our heart. Let the resurrection of Christ reign in our bodies. Let us bow our heads in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, we are grateful to your holy name for this once again privilege to be in this place that your hand has outlined for the worship of your holy name. And so, allow your inheritance in the name of the blood of the covenant to be lifted to heights higher than us and to break all evil and sin that binds us. May in this service be cursed as before all the works of devil, illnesses, poverty, premature death, demonic dependencies, all forms of fears, depression, destruction, stagnancy, ignorance, all of this, let it depart from the tents of your holy people and stand, Lord, on the place of your rest, you and the ark of your greatness. And may your saints be clothed in your salvation and may they rejoice before your countenance. Give us more from your Spirit. Fill us with your Holy Spirit. Allow us to find your holy countenance. I present this service into your divine arms. Guide it with your uplifted hand. Almighty God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. May the Lord bless you. You may be seated. The book of Matthew, chapter 5, verses 45 and 48 so that you may be sons of your Father who is in heaven. For he makes his sun rise on the evil and on the good, and sends rain on the just and on the unjust. You therefore must be perfect, as your heavenly Father is perfect. The sermon that would like to continue is called, Called to Perfection. To the perfection of our heavenly Father, because there exist different understandings of perfection among Christians. In the world, there doesn't exist perfection. That's what they say. They say there is no perfection in anything, in everything. Every, in the world, everything is subjective, given that the world progresses, but who knows where it progresses to. And based on the fact that they create new nanotechnology, they can't create the technology of man himself and his character. Their character of man is degrading and not psycho psychologists can't do anything with this, nor philosophers, nor wise men. They don't even want to talk about this. They bottle up this idea thinking that the majority of people are headed towards somewhere. They're headed towards perdition. All the countries of this world are headed toward perdition. The world is headed toward perdition. Christianity, so-called Christianity, in its majority, is marching under the song of praise to hell because they don't care about bringing fruit to God. To be perfect, just as the Heavenly Father is perfect, in order to be likened in their character according to the character of the Heavenly Father because His perfection is comprised of His character, His relationship toward good and evil. God is not a tolerant figure. He loves the righteous and hates the unrighteous or the lawless. And thus, He sends His reign only on the just in measure and in time. And on the unjust, He floods and drowns. And therefore, with His Son, He shines on the just, blessing them, and the unjust, cursing them. And Scripture calls us, for us, to be perfect and the phrase so that you may be or let there be is the phrase with which God created this world and so this promise commandment is the inheritance of the saints of all time and it is addressed by Christ to his disciples and therefore those who do not accept the authority of the person sent by God have no relation whatsoever to the inheritance of this commandment and will likely never have a relation to it. This means that they have never understood it 
and will likely never be able to understand it, what is contained in it. Because the perfection of the Heavenly Father is not comprised of going to uh, preach to the earth. People don't even understand that preaching to the world occurs when we are the light. And it doesn't matter whether, where you are. If you are light to the world, you preach the good news. And if you are not a light to the world, then even if you have a level of theology, a doctorate degree, and you are going to be sent somewhere, anywhere, and you are going to have some kind of success, and those people that you are going to bring, you are going to bring them not to Christ, but to yourselves. And you are going to lead them to perdition, there where you yourself are going. Because no one has sent you in this kind of form. The one who preaches the good news is a person who is a light to the world. And in connection with the fulfillment of the commandment to be vigilant over the word of God in our heart, and we are called to be vigilant over the word of God in our heart, just as God is vigilant over the word spoken by Him, over the word spoken by Him and addressed to us in the temple of our body. Because God is vigilant only in the temple of His body over His word, which He has magnified and exalted above all His name. And with regard to this, we have stopped to study the following question. What specific goals is the righteousness of God in our hearts called to pursue, this righteousness with which we collaborate with or called to collaborate with in our heart, with that truth that is contained in our heart? And when the seed of truth that is contained in our heart grow, dies in the good soil of our heart, and it offers fruit, only then are we able to cooperate with God by way of offering the fruit of righteousness. And what is our righteousness based on? It is based on the fact that the purpose of the righteousness of God in our heart, accepted by us in the broken tablets of testimony in which we, in the death of the Lord Jesus, with the law, died to the law, so that in the new tablets of testimony signifying the resurrection of Christ, we could receive justification in order to live for the one who died and rose. As it is written, Christ was delivered up because of our offenses and was raised because of our justification, Romans 4.25. So, justification we do not receive in the death of the Lord Jesus. We receive it in His resurrection. If we understand the truth of resurrection, how to use it, but in order to use resurrection, it is necessary to use death. In order to clothe ourselves in garments of justification, it is necessary for us to take off the garments of uncleanliness. This is what this is referring to. It is impossible to use the resurrection of Christ if we have not taken off the old man with his works. If our character has not been transformed into the character of Christ, if our heart is not like the heart of our Heavenly Father, when a child grows, he begins to show uh, the character traits of his parents. Just like here, he who is born of God, growing, he is going to exhibit the character traits of his Heavenly Father under the condition he is given a decision when he comes when he comes to a certain spiritual age he is given the choice to either choose between the character of his Heavenly Father that is contained in his new man because his new man is the carrier of this character and the old man who is the character of carrier of the character of the fallen cherubim and a person needs to choose because in him leave these two characters and up until a certain time one manifests himself then the other we fight one and to the other we allow to exhibit himself but at a certain level and at a certain age we cannot distinguish one character from the other sometimes we think that this is the character of the heavenly father but this is the character of the fallen cherubim in fact because it doesn't come to us with horns and a tail. He comes to us in the form of the Holy Spirit or an angel of light. He is clothed in the garments of light and he represents scripture. He operates with the places of scripture. He is a professional in this. And if we don't know scripture well enough, he can easily 
sway us away from the truth. So that we could receive the affirmation of our salvation in the new tablets that signify the resurrection of Christ in order to give God the basis to give us the promise to be an heir of peace, not through the former law, but through righteousness of faith, just as he had given to Abraham and his seed. As it is written, for the promise that he would be the heir of peace was not to Abraham or to his seed through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. God cannot, with the former law, give us this promise. The former law is the form or is the law of works. This is not the law of Moses. The law of Moses is the law of works. This is when Christians think that, thinks that they are under grace, but they try to please God with their works. When a person tries to please God with his works, he uses the law of works. What does he try to do? He tries to justify himself with his actions. Instead of accepting that which has already been won for us on the cross, in the death of the Lord Jesus and in His resurrection, and then simply to practice righteousness. A person doesn't practice righteousness, he tries to be justified. I'm talking about a Christian. This is the fall of this Christian. And therefore, the covenant of peace in the heart of a person, given that he is so, is a result of the obedience of his faith to the faith of God in the words of the messenger of God. The faith of God is information that comes from the preached word of the word of the messenger of God. Faith is from hearing. This is information, not an emotion, not a feeling. This is not that w which I feel. The faith of God does not depend on our feelings. We might offend one another and be offended in our feelings, but faith has nothing in common with this offense. You might, you, you can be lifted up above this offense over the information that you have and begin to proclaim not what you feel, but that which Scripture says, how we ought to behave ourselves. And thus, you will begin to heal, to heal your wounds. God isn't going to just because heal your wounds or my wounds. We are called to heal it through the proclamation of our lips that proclaim the faith of our hearts, through the obedience of our faith to the truth of the Word of God that is contained in our heart. And therefore, the faith of God is the generalismus, and our faith is the a soldier that submits to this captain. Look upon the captain and the fulfill, fulfiller of your faith, Jesus, it says in the Bible. And so, to test ourselves, to test ourselves to see if we have the reign of the peace of God in our heart, which identifies us as sons of peace and as holy unto God, to test our hearts for the subject of the reigning peace of God in it, should be done by the ability to be a peacemaker, to have an inner state of peace which characterizes us as sons of God, as written, Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Peacemakers are wise people, those that have the fear of the Lord. It is impossible to practice peace without having in ourselves the fear of the Lord, without having this wisdom. A state of peace is the state of a wise heart. A wise heart that knows what to do and when to do it, and what means to enact in order to fulfill the will of God. Six signs according to which we could judge that we are partakers to the sons of peace were already the subject of our study, and we have stopped to study the seventh one. This is according to our ability to clothe our essence into the holy or selective love of God. But above all these things, put on love, which is the bond of perfection. And let the peace of God rule in your hearts. Only after we are clothed in love, the peace of God will receive the authority to the right to reign in our hearts, to rule in our hearts. We do not clothe ourselves in the love of God agape, which is the bond of perfection. We cannot speak of any kind of peace. And let the peace of God rule in your hearts, to which you were called in one body, and be friendly. We are called to the peace of God, which dwells in the body of Christ. When it says in one body, this does not mean in the specific congregation. This is referring to the body of Christ, which is comprised of multiple churches. Out of the multitude of Christians 
across the whole earth in all countries this is the body of Christ in scripture the holy and selective love of God at God is presented by the Holy Spirit in the light of seven unearthly dignities and properties through the preached word of the apostles and prophets which according to their nature are the unchanging properties of God here is presented the heart of the Heavenly Father what properties he has and practically when we are born of God then we are programmed we are programmed to these properties they can't right away uh, portray themselves in us it's a program and a program can be exhibited or expressed when we as a programmable device will grow into the full measure of the stature of Christ this is virtue knowledge self-control patience godliness brotherly love and love second Peter chapter 1 verses 2 through 8 this is called as we often say the ladder of Peter uh, with many people not even understanding what kind of ladder this is in fact this is not a ladder a ladder can't be water in a cup because these properties are united in one they are dissolved in one another what kind of ladder can we talk about here oh you in virtue now you're one step higher when you have knowledge no this can't be so because knowledge comes from virtue and therefore this is not a ladder this is something that is united in one this is the fruit that has different kinds of ingredients and here is presented the heart of the Heavenly Father and the heart of a holy person the heart of the child a child of God that growing in the temple of God will begin to manifest these properties but in order to manifest them a child of God must strive must study God's role in his role and what they must do so that these properties can be manifested in them and as we often say the first thing that we need to do is with the law die to the law so that we could live for the one who died and rose so that we die to our nation the house of our father and our corrupt lusts this means to take off the old man this is the first thing that we ought to do because only then will this program be able to be turned on in us until we do this the program cannot realize itself we can speak with our lips but the program will not be realized in us because the heart is not cleansed of dead works and therefore in a certain format out of the seven available characteristics which in their totality determine in our heart the goodness of God or the love of God agape we have already studied five properties and we have stopped to study the sixth one this is the calling to show in our faith brotherly love which transfers us from the state of eternal death to the state of eternal life this property uh, the Holy Spirit has uh, stopped us out for a long time because it seems as if there is a goal set here because this transfers us from the state of eternal death to the state of eternal life as it is written we know and again I want to once again uh, pay attention here that it's not we feel or we think but we know we know we, this knowledge has come from the information of the preached word the preached word of the person whom God has sent and not the people that we have selected for ourselves by way of a disgusting uh, democratic vote the most atrocious in this world is democracy Democrats are terrorists they are terrorists who despise mankind of course their followers who don't realize anything think that truly there exists democracy that there exists the freedom of the word there is no freedom uh, they they have freedom they think but thanks to God we have a kind of freedom that not neither technocrats nor Democrats have we have freedom from sin and no one can place a lock on our lips because our lips are bridled with meekness of the truth of the Word of God 
that are stronger than any kind of weapons, stronger than any kind of Democrat or technocrat, stronger than Judaism and stronger than Islam. I'm referring to Judaism, not in the literal sense, but in the sense that today it is, uh, in, the, in the sense that it is proclaimed today by the Jews. They have transformed Judaism. Judaism truly is the teaching of birth from above. They have uh, distorted it. They don't believe in birth from above. They consider themselves exclusive. When a person considers, or a na nationality considers themselves exclusive, Scripture says that this is selfishness of the highest level. When God selected Abraham, He did not sel select him to be the father of Jews. He selected him to be the father of many nations. But when the nation, when a nation says, this is us, this is called nationalism, Nazism, fascism. When, pa when patriot, uh, patriotism is disciplined in a certain kind of country, they are expressing nationalism. But if they do not, but if they don't bring forth patriotism, then no one will go fight for this land. No one will go out to war. They condemn nationalism against the one they go fight, and they go to fight as nationalists, but they say, we're not nationalists. We respect all. But this is a hidden form of it. The world is found in such a state that it is incapable of not having war. They are incapable of not having war because they want to have, to dictate, to be the great giant. This is contained in the fallen cherubim, and this has been passed down to all people, and only thanks to the mercy of God through the church that God guides the hearts of kings. It doesn't matter what kinds of kings they are. God uh, guided the heart of Nero as well in his own interests. Of course, he had allowed, and he allows wars to occur. However, God doesn't create wars. Wars is the result is the result of that which people have sown and now they are reaping and they say let's praise that there is no war what you want people to not reap that which they sow did christ call us to pray for there not to be wars for there not to be hunger he on the contrary simply said there will be wars and rumors of wars earthquakes hunger famine all of these kinds of plagues and illnesses, viruses. What must you do? You must lift up your heads for the day of your deliverance is coming. The world is condemned. This must happen and this will happen. It is, it is fruitless to pray for there to not be war, to stop war. How can you stop war if the war is happening in your heart between the old man and the new man? Stop it within yourselves. As soon as you stop it within yourselves, as soon as I stop it within myself, only then will I become a carrier of peace. What kind of peace? The peace of God. And then I'm a light to this world. And then those who have been pre-selected by God, chosen in this world, in the different countries, God will allow them to hear this word from the sons of peace. And so we know this is a strong evidence and testimony. We know that we have passed from death to life. Why? Because we love the brethren. We do not love everyone. We love only our brethren. Christ died only for His church. Having washed her through the word, He did not come to save the whole world. He came to die to His church. John 3.16 says, God, for God so loved the world that He gave His Son, His one and only Son, so that whoever believed in Him in this world shall not perish but have eternal life. You see what kind of uh, translation this was that was incorrect. The ending words, for God so loved, so that whoever believes in Him shall not perish. How did God love the world if He can't save this world? Does He save? He save only the... Christians, this is an incorrect translation. For God so loved every believer in this world that He gave His one and only Son. This is what the translation ought to be. Then it is not going to, to oppose the initial words because we are reading a translation and it oftentimes is incorrect. Sometimes it is correct, sometimes it is incorrect. 
But even if it is a correct translation, when this book is read upon a correct translation, Jews in their own language, they are blind. Christ has said they are blind, they do not see, they are incapable of seeing, because these are the thoughts of God, and they are opened and revealed only to those who seek God and who are ready to pay the price in order to find Him, in order to unite with Him as one. And so, he who does not love his brother abides in death. Whoever hates his brother is a murderer. You see, it is not absolutely necessary to take a knife or a bullet to kill a person. It is enough to simply hate him. Hatred oftentimes hides behind envy. If we are envious of someone, this means that this is hatred. How come Cain had killed Abel? Because he had envy. And that's why he hated his brother due to his envy. He paid attention to the fact that God had favored Abel and not him. And he had brought from the best of his fruits. Sometimes people say he needed to bring the sacrifice of blood. Well, how is he going to bring the sacrifice of blood? Because God did not give him sheep, but God gave him the the land. And from this land, he had offered fruit to God, which the land had produced. Scripture says, he looked at Cain and at his gift. He looked at Abel and his gift. This means that God looks not at the sacrifice, but on you, on me. He looks at my motives, what I am pursuing with the sacrifice, what I am pursuing with my prayer. If I am pursuing my own interests, if I am praying with the words of God, but I pursue my own goals, I want to use the gifts of the Holy Spirit, anointing, blessing, in order for the flesh, not to grow in the full measure of the stature of Christ, not in order to bind the flesh with its corrupt lust, but in order to seek some kinds of benefits in Scripture so that I can give my flesh the opportunity to satisfy its lusts and desires. And this is calamity. This is death when we hate. This is a murder. And you know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. 1 John chapter 3, verses 14-15 through 15. In this regard, as in the previous components, the virtue of God and His unique goodness to us, which we are called to show in our faith, in seven components, we had to answer four classic questions. What does Scripture say about the power of brotherly love which we are called to show in our faith? What purpose is the power of brotherly love called to fulfill which we must demonstrate in our faith? In relation to our neighbors, and what condition must be fulfilled in order to receive power to show brotherly love in our faith? And in a certain format, we have already studied the first three questions and have stopped to study the fourth question. By what signs should we test ourselves for the demonstration of brotherly love in our faith? We have already studied the first six signs according to which we could define the essence of befitting praise coming from our heart in the atmosphere of brotherly love, which transfers us from death to life, and therefore we will turn to studying the seventh sign. The seventh sign according to which we should define the essence of befitting praise that comes from our heart and atmosphere of brotherly love is according to the presence of an earthly joy in the paths of the revelations of the Holy Spirit and our comfort in the statutes of the Almighty. Practically, joy and comfort in the commandments are uh, mixed and united with one another. Comfort comes specifically from this unearthly joy. I have rejoiced in the way of your revelations, and this kind of joy is now expressed in all, as much as in all riches. I rejoice as much as in all riches. And we are not referring to perishable riches. The children of God never rejoiced from having perishable riches. David never rejoiced from the fact that he had riches, and his riches were so great that not one of the kings that was living in his territory, not the Egyptian kings, not the Assyrian kings that had lived there, 
none had that kind of authority and that power of those riches that he had. On the contrary, they were, they had a lot less. All the surrounding governments, they had paid tribute to the king of Israel. He was rich. He called himself poor. He says, I am poor. Your word, he says, it is sweeter than honey and honeycomb. It is better than gold and fine gold. This is what he called his riches. Every All riches are every promise. Therefore, he says, I have rejoiced in the way of revelations. I rejoice in the way of your revelations as much as in all riches, as much as in all promises. Promises are our inheritance, which God has opened. And when God reveals it to us in part, David says, I rejoice in the path of your revelations as much as in all riches. He, therefore, he also says, thanks to the fact that I am found on the way of your revelations and I am filled with joy, I will meditate on your commandments and contemplate your ways. I will be comforted by your statutes. I will not forget your word. Psalms 119 verses 14 through 16. A question arises, what conditions will be necessary to fulfill for our heart to be filled with unblemished joy? According to this place of scripture, to grow in our heart the kingdom of heaven and the fruit of unblemished joy is possible only when accepting the Holy Holy Spirit as Lord and ruler of our life. In this sign according to which we should define the essence of befitting praise, coming from a heart in the atmosphere of brotherly love is comprised of five components which in their union are found in a wonderful balance in relation to one another because they flow from one another and verify the authenticity of one another and therefore unblemished joy discovers itself first on the way of the revelations of the Lord, pondering over the commandments of the Lord, contemplating the ways of the Lord, being comforted by the statutes of the word, and keeping in remembrance the words of the Lord. If the components of this sign are the property of our heart, then this will mean that our prayer meets the requirements of befitting praise, which comes from our heart in the atmosphere of brotherly love that transfers us from death to life. And so the first component of this sign according to which we could define the essence of befitting praise coming from our good heart. Again, this first initial component will show itself in the others and it will be comprised of the fact that we will discover and experience unblemished joy in the ways of the revelations of the Lord. The ways of the Lord are the ways on which God walks, which are comprised of the revelations of the Holy Spirit regarding the essence of the commandments and statutes of the Lord hidden in our heart that lead us to the realization of the salvation of our soul and body, which are presented in the sworn promises of God that we are called to know through instruction in faith. At the same time, we should not lose sight of the fact that the way of the revelations of the commandments and statutes of the Lord is the way of light in the format of the word that proceeds from the lips of God, along which first God himself walks. As written, but if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. Again, not quite a correct translation here. Some words are let go of here. Uh, we ought to have said, if we walk in the light just as He is in the light. But if we walk in the light as He is in the light, then we need to uh, interpret. If we walk in, the, in that light in which God walks, we have fellowship with one another. Only then will we be able to show the power of brotherly love. If we walk in that light in which God walks, along those ways which God walks. And only then the blood of Jesus Christ, His Son, cleanses us from all sin. 1 John 1, 7. The blood of Jesus Christ receives the right to power to cleanse us only when we show brotherly love to one another. As we had said, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. You see, as we forgive our debtors. God, it turns out, forgives us thanks to the fact that we forgive the offense or the resentment that is brought onto us by our 
neighbors, and then the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us. And so in order for it to cleanse us, we must confess this sin before God. If I confess this sin before God, but I have no brotherly love, the blood of Christ will not cleanse me. The phrase, I have rejoiced in the way of revelations as much as in all riches, means that the ways along which God walks, comprised of the word that comes from His lips, are called to lead us to the joy of our Lord. You remember the parable, go into the joy of your master. These are the ways. And what were what ways were these? These ways were when they had placed the deposit of their salvation into circulation, and they brought to their master that which they had gained. They say, you have given me two, here is four. You have given me five, here is ten. I have gained it. And then he says to them, go into the joy of your Lord. Same thing here. We are called to enter into the joy of our Lord, our Master. It turns out that heaven is filled with the atmosphere of joy. Our inheritance is the inheritance of joy. If we accept the inheritance of a joy, we accept the atmosphere of joy, which finds its expression in the pure, imperishable, and unsearchable inheritance of Christ that is hidden in our heart in the format of the truth of the reigning teaching of Christ, which gives God the basis to protect it for us in heaven. If it is not in our heart, God will not save it in heaven for us. According to the words of Scripture, this imperishable inheritance is ready to be revealed in the end times through the faith of our heart that has been affirmed through the fruit of righteousness that we have grown. Faith must be affirmed. If faith is not affirmed, it will be lost by us. And therefore, only to the category of saints that has hidden in their heart the imperishable inheritance of Christ, in the format of the reigning teaching of Christ, it will be ready to be revealed in the end times, which means that at the end times, this category of saints will enter into this imperishable inheritance that was kept from the pre previous generations of saints. For that very reason, that they did not li live in these end times, which this promise ought to have been revealed. As it is written, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to His abundant mercy has begotten us again to a living hope, the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled. Uh, listen closely to the words of Peter incorruptible and undefiled and that does not fade away reserved in heaven for you who are kept by the power of God through faith for salvation ready to be revealed in the last time he says here that he does not know this yet he says that this is what it is that it is pure it is incorruptible it is holy undefiled but what kinds of promise what is this promise it is comprised of promises but he says these are ready to be revealed in the last time, and I, I do not know them yet. I know that they are pure, incorruptible, and undefiled. And they are called to be opened in the last time. And he spoke to those in his time. In this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while, if need be, you have been grieved by various trials, that the genuineness of your faith, being much more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to praise, honor, and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ, whom having not seen, you love. Though now you do not see him, yet believing, you rejoice with joy inexpressible and full of glory, receiving the end of your faith, the salvation for your souls. Have you paid attention? Finally, receiving the end of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Without having this joy, it is impossible to receive salvation of souls. And if I don't receive the salvation of my soul, then I will perish. The new man will perish, and then my soul will perish, and my body will perish. And to test ourselves that we are found in the ways of the revelations of the Lord along which God walks, should be done according to unblemished joy in our merry heart that is able to do good, like medicine, in our essence, amid any tribulations that are called to test our faith. 
in order to affirm it. If, there, if our faith is not tested, it won't be affirmed. If the potter has made a vessel, and if he does not place it into the fire, in order to uh, in order to prepare it, then this vessel can't be used. It won't be possible to pour oil or wine and joy of the Holy Spirit in there. As it is written, a merry heart does good like medicine, but a sad spirit dries the bones. And so one of the signs according to which we can define in ourselves the presence of the fruit of unblemished joy will be our merry heart in the subject of a joyfully burning lamp whose joyful burning will serve for us as a medicinal property, healing, restoring, and strengthening our faith and our trust toward the Word of God. Because we all are focused on physical healing, but God is focused firstly at the healing of our faith. Because our faith is ill. If it would not be ill, then we would rejoice. And this joy of this faith, this joyful faith, we would uphold our bodies. We would challenge these illnesses. And those illnesses that we are called to overcome, we have overcome. And those illnesses in which we must show faithfulness to God, we would simply rise up above them. Sometimes God gives us the ability to change our circumstances and sometimes God lets us rise above these circumstances. Moses says, Lord, you send me, but I have a stammering tongue. He, he is using God. He says, heal, heal my stammering tongue, then send me. But he can't say this directly to God. He says, how will I go? You are sending me and I have a stammering tongue. God doesn't take us take him away from the circumstance from his stammering but he says but you have your brother Aaron who is not stammering you will be a uh, God to him and he will be a prophet he will speak to the people for you he said that Moses had to rise up above this circumstances there are illnesses with which God disciplines us allowing them in our bodies so that we can rise up above them and there are illnesses with um, which he is going to free us from until there comes this glorified promise that was withheld from many saints for many saints but uh, very few still had known it because Apostle Paul to to the, to the Hebrews writes, they have died in faith, not receiving what has been promised. This means that they knew this promise, that their bodies were called to be transformed before they were to be raptured in meeting with the Lord in the clouds. But why did not God do this in their time? Why did He did not let them satisfy in this promise? So that they might not receive perfection without us. There has not yet been the full amount of Gentiles, when there's a full amount of Gentiles, then this is going to be the beginning of the doorstep of the week of Daniel. The week of the da of Daniel will begin, and the first stage is going to be signified by the fact that sta saints that have prepared themselves for this, in whose hearts is clearly written that they have this, they have accepted this, and they rejoice in this. Despite these afflictions, they rejoice that they have this promise. And they are going to be transformed in the blink of an eye. And so, a sad spirit. A sad spirit is the result of a stiff heart that is led by the pride of an unrenewed mind, in which there is no basis for the atmosphere of unblemished joy, which deprives God of the basis to do good to a person with a sad spirit and to heal him to heal his faith and to define in ourselves the essence of the fruit of unblemished joy as well as the condition that is necessary to fulfill to grow it in the format of the fruit of righteousness and release it in our prayer i will remind us of the properties of unearthly joy and what purpose is contained in the source of unearthly joy because in scripture the property and character contained in the word joy is prescribed in prayer as a commandment, command, as an unswerving prescription, and as an urgent military order 
failure to comply with which is punishable by death or by the final severance of the relationship contained in a covenant with God. Thus, Apostle Jude, summing up his short epistle to the Church of Christ, singled out the property of the fruit of joy as a special virtue, which is called to be an integral part of the kingdom of heaven, represented in our salvation in Christ Jesus. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy, we have made this our manifestation when we conclude our service. From these words it follows that for God a blemish or fault in joy is the basis that God lacks to keep us from stumbling into perdition in order to present us before His glory, and that the glory of God dwells exclusively in the atmosphere of unblemished joy and is its expression. A blemish or fault in joy is a stain or flaw that defines impurity, abomination, and lies in our heart. Not getting rid of such a vice by renouncing our people, our Father's house, and our carnal life will not allow us to enter into the New Jerusalem so that we can become partakers of the New and Holy Jerusalem that is built here on earth and that is found here on earth. A part of this Jerusalem is found in heaven and a part is on earth. But there shall by no means enter anything that defiles or causes an abomination or a lie, but only those who are written in the Lamb's Book of Life. Revelation 21, 27. Defining the source of unblemished joy and its inherent natural properties in Scripture, it follows that first, attention, unblemished joy is not an emotion, it is the informational program of God that is comprised in the discipline of the mind and meek heart, which is, expresses itself in meek lips, that are bridled by the truth contained in the heart. This is not that which I can feel, this is that which I know and I release in my words. Because it is impossible to feel what is heavenly in our physical body. There is no physical body, those instruments and properties to feel it, because the body has been created to comprehend the physical world and function in this physical world. Our body has not been cre created in the fourth dimension, spiritual dimension, to function and to know the spiritual realm, to acknowledge the spiritual realm. Our spirit has been created, that has been born of God, our heart. Second, unblemished joy in prayer can come only from the unblemished heart of a person who carries the state and expresses it in his thoughts, words, and actions. So, thoughts, words, actions. Third, if in our heart there will dwell the atmosphere of unblemished joy, then our prayer will express the property of this unearthly joy in the words of the faith of God contained in our heart. We will not depend on what is happening around us and with our body. We with joy are going to proclaim the faith of God that dwells in our heart. Because the faith of God is the word of God that dwells forever and everything else that is around us and everything that is happening with our body is temporary. It does not endure forever. Only the word of God endures forever. Fourth, we should distinguish earthly or ordinary joy expressing itself in our emotions from supernatural joy that has its distinctive roots in God, its distinctive source in God, in its distinctive origin in God. These two kinds of joys, as we have already said, are two programs that oppose one another because they come from two different sources, God and the fallen cherubim. Six, the heart of a person is the programmable device, and the kind of joy he gives preference to clothes him in it, and it becomes governing in his essence. Whatever program we give preference to, that program becomes governing in our essence. 
If we prefer earthly joy, earthly joy that is comprised then it will measure our relationship with God and on the other hand will suppress and oppress unearthly joy if we give preference to earthly joy if we prefer joy that comes from above then it also will be the measure of our relations with God one and the other are the measure of our relations carnal people measure their relations with God based on what they do a spiritual person measures his relationships with, with God based on what God has done for him, who he is, and who they are to him. They proclaim this, and with this they measure the relationship with God. And a carnal measures what he has done for God, not what God has done for him, but what he has done for God. Carnal person, foolish, what can you do to God? Because scripture says that a carnal person is foolish. What can you, a foolish man, do for God in order to astonish him? And God is astonished when we begin to magnify that work that he has done in Christ Jesus, that he has given us justification as a gift of grace, and we don't need to earn it. We don't need to do something in order to become righteous. We need to simply practice righteousness because we have been born holy and righteous. Now, I remind you, at the same time, that due to its supernatural nature, unearthly joy is impossible to experience or feel at the level of our physical capabilities. So, unlike earthly joy, it is not the result of any emotion or any feeling that raises the physical and carnal mood. Because supernatural joy is a component of the kingdom of heaven in our heart that is called to express itself in the discipline of our mind will and heart to practice peace in our heart it practices peace in our heart as well as balances controls and leads our emotions after itself as written for the kingdom of god is not eating and drinking but righteousness and peace and joy in the holy spirit romans 14 17. these three components that proceed from righteousness from this righteousness comes peace and from this peace comes joy joy in the holy spirit they come from one another, but they are united into one. Therefore, joy in the Holy Spirit is a component of the kingdom of heaven in us. If we don't have this, and it must be in us in the format of the informational word, this means that we don't have it. And so, supernatural joy is called to present in our heart love toward righteousness and hatred toward lawlessness through our meek lips that are bridled by the truth contained in our heart. You have loved righteousness and hated lawlessness, therefore God your God has anointed you with the oil of gladness more than your companions. Hebrews 1 9. Psalms 44. This is where Apostle Paul took that phrase. And here we see that supernatural joy expresses itself in love towards the carriers of righteousness and hatred towards the carriers of lawlessness. It is impossible to express love toward righteousness and hatred toward lawlessness when it is not found somewhere in someone. It must be placed in some kind of programmable device. If it is not in a programmable device, it cannot express itself. And when it cannot express itself and discover, be discovered, you can't love it or hate it. You can love it or hate it only in the programmable device, which is the heart of man. And when he, from his evil heart, carries out evil, and the other carries out from his good heart good, then you will love good in the carriers of good, and you will hate evil in the carriers of evil. And when these emotions, our emotions, will be bridled by the bridle of meekness that is comprised of the discipline of our renewed mind and will, that have been made dependent on the truth in the heart, only then will our emotions be able to feel, to feel the goodness. Take a look here. There is uh, the essence of feeling. Only then will our emotions be able to feel, to feel in itself the goodness and medicine of our joyfully heart, which becomes the source of our unearthly joy that strives toward eternal life. 
So unearthly joy. Unearthly joy can excite earthly joy, having cleansed it, leading it after itself. If unearthly joy does not lead earthly joy, then this earthly joy is blemished. But when it, it is under the governing of unearthly joy, then it is good. According to revelations of scripture, unblemished joy as an, earthly comp- as an unearthly component is called to define the essence of our continual prayer. This is one of the unchanging properties of the names of God Himself, as well as one of the properties of the children born of God. This property of unblemished joy could be accepted only in the seed of the word of grace and in the face of the Holy Spirit. The face of the Holy Spirit that uncovers the meaning of this seed, this truth. And only then be grown into the fruit of righteousness through the discipline of the will, mind, and heart that are directed to our continual dwelling in the Word of God and the Holy Spirit. And thus, supernatural joy, according to its origin and manifestation, is stable, continual, unchanging, and does not depend on earthly circumstances tied to losses and the gain of material goods. Defining earthly joy and earthly gladness, Scripture states that the triumphing of the wicked is short and the joy of the hypocrite is but for a moment. Job 25 Even in laughter, the heart may sorrow and the end of mirth may be grief. Proverbs 14, 13 You see what kind of joy, earthly joy is. It is short and the end of it may be grief and will be grief. And upon this mirth, a person's heart might be in pain. Uh, But upon a joyful heart, the heart is not in pain. There is no wounds. It heals the wounds of the heart. When we proclaim forgiveness of our neighbor who has violated our heart, he has wounded it, and I begin to proclaim this before God and condescend to my neighbor, then my words become an oil and they heal the wound of my heart. And in relation to people with an unclean heart and hands that had filled Zion then and today, Apostle James wrote, Lament and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to gloom. James 4 9. False charismatic services. Uh, In false charismatic services, this joy is brought up by special music and special songs that excite and that uplift this kind of joy, the rhythm. And in this moment, they forget. They forget that things are not well between them and God, that they are in sin. But they rejoice in these songs and they sing hallelujah. And the word is that this foolish as well that they then speak it must be joy and fill fill them because if you say something seriously then either they will fall asleep or they will come to horror then why did i just dance around and and praise uh, sing hallelujah and praise god and then through the word of god they find out that she has no right to praise god in the first place she doesn't have any kind of legitimate rights to draw near to god to enter into the sanctuary because she is not a king priest or prophet but no one has told her of this. That's why she rejoices in this way. But to end of joy uh, will be gloom. Pa- Apostle Paul talk t- tells to the churches that they must um, lament and mourn and weep. And so, for trust and earthly joy, when people prefer to, which people pervert over supernatural joy, God will one day bring them to judgment. Rejoice, O young man, in your youth. And let your heart cheer you in the days of your youth. Walk in the ways of your heart and in the sight of your eyes. But know that for all these things, God will bring you into judgment. Ecclesiastes 11.9 uh, This is how I understand it. This is how I see things. Well, take a look. How you un- This is how you understand it. But because you understand in this way, because you have decided to be based, to be based on how you think, God will bring you to judgment. You must kill in yourself, this is how I think, or in my opinion. And you must say, Lord, whatever your word, 
you will give me, I will be submissive to this word in the church. I have prepared my heart, I prepare my heart. And the word that you will give to me, that word I will submit to. I will not come to church with my own word, with my own understanding. I don't agree with this. Turning to the unique wisdom of Scripture in the definition of unearthly joy, it follows that it can be born and abide only in the heart of a person reborn from the imperishable seed of the word of truth, called to grow the seed into the fruit of righteousness. The presence of the fruit of unblemished joy should be tested by communion with the body of Christ, which means to be placed in Christ or to be a partaker of the meeting in the face of a good wife who has the dignity of a narrow gate. We must have some kind of arguments, evidence that I abide in Christ. To abide in Christ means to abide in His body. Not every church is a good wife in the dignity of a narrow gate. In many churches, pastors doesn't know what narrow gates are and what a good wife is. They take this good wife and they attribute this to a specific face. They don't see that this is referring to not this woman or this girl, this is referring to the church. But for some reason they attribute this to an ordinary person. And since the primary source of Balmish joy is God Himself, then it should be f- followed that God is a standard and measure which determines the property and kind of a blemish joy. So how can we define that God has this joy? According to the thoughts that He has and the words that He speaks. Because this joy is information that comes from God's lips. Because of this, unearthly joy and the ways of the revelations of the Lord is not only the ways along which God walks, but also the property of God and His atmosphere in which God dwells, as well as one of His glorious names with which He triumphs over His enemies. God triumphs over His enemies. One of the victories that was given to Israel when the enemy had come at him with a great amount and surpassed him in weapon, then according to the revelation in himself, Jehoshaphat placed placed in front of himself not the special forces of his army, but he placed priests in front of the army with trumpets, and behind them was a choir. And the priest had sounded with the trumpets, not just sounded, but this was a melody, and the choir had exclaimed and praised God. And when the trumpets had sounded by the priests and the choir had exalted God, in this moment, God made a disagreement between the peoples and they stood up, they rose against one another and they overcame one another. And Israel went to go and battle with one another. And when they approached, there was no one to fight with. They had to simply carry out the tribute. For, for several days, they had carried out this tribute. Israel grew rich. You see, sometimes we don't even need to step into battle with our enemy. When we begin to say who God is for us in Christ Jesus, what God has done for us, who we are to Him, and when we proclaim this, then these words destroy, destroy and have the blow, as today is similar to the Russian rocket that is able to land exactly in the goal on the target that is 10,000 kilometers away. No one yet has this kind of weapon. But I'm simply bringing a, an example that prays in the same manner, it hits the exact target, whatever this en- enemy may be, this praise hits the target, we can overcome the enemy. This is the exact weapon that will hit the target exactly. And I will go to the altar of God, to God in my exceeding joy, and on the harp I will praise you, O God, my God. Why are you cast down, O my soul, and why are you disquieted within me? Hope in God, for I shall yet praise Him, the help of my countenance and my God. Psalms 43, 4-5 through 5. 
So he says to his soul, for her not to be sorrowful, because I come up to the altar of God, to God my exceeding joy. He says to his soul that God is our joy. Why are you cast down, O my soul? Hope in God and this hope or trust will overcome our enemy and this trust is in our words, in the proclamations, it expresses the faith of our heart. First, the method by which the fruit of unearthly joy is nurtured, which is necessary for worship in spirit and, joy, and truth, is a payment of a price which consists in the rejection of our people, our Father's house, and the corrupt desires of our carnal life. Secondly, the method by which the fruit of unearthly joy necessary for worship in spirit and truth is nurtured is the legal prayer that is fit for kings, priests, and prophets. Because it is prayer that is the way to God and means for communication with God. And God is the source of joy. This is how Christ, being taken up on the cross, prayed to His Father. But now I come to you, and these things I speak in the world, that they may have my joy fulfilled in themselves. John 17, 13. Can you imagine Christ praying in the Garden of Gethsemane? His sweat that was bloody from the horror. And he is praying so that his followers could have in themselves his perfect joy. This means that despite his circumstance, he had perfect joy in him. It is perfect joy that had allowed him to go up on the cross and to take upon himself our sins and to die for our sins. It is this joy, this perfect joy that was found in him that raised him up from the dead. If this joy would not have been present, God would not have been able to have any kind of basis to raise him. God has the basis to open the promises that are found in us. Only when deep in our heart there is this element of joy, the fruit of the Spirit, righteousness, peace, and joy. When we have this, this kingdom of God in these three components, then God has the basis to do something for us. And so, the means and tool for accepting and cultivating the seed of the kingdom of heaven in oneself as a component of the fruit of an earthly joy is continual prayer which is done in accordance with the twelve requirements contained in the twelve precious stones of the breastplate of judgment embedded in twelve golden settings which are in our heart the image of the truth of the word it is as we have said before it is not the golden settings that are carved to fit the precious stones but the precious stones that are carved, carved to fit the golden settings on the breastplate of judgment of the high priest and therefore every component of the price for accepting and cultivating in our spirit the seed of the kingdom of heaven into the fruit of the spirit in constituting a blemished joy is a format and kind of a continual prayer that meets the requirements of the breastplate of judgment in which we as warriors of prayer are called to arrange our heart the first component of the price for growing the fruit of unblemished joy or offering the fruit of unblemished joy in the essence of our continual prayer is comprised of gaining an unblemished heart by way of cleansing our conscience from dead works because unblemished joy can come only from an unblemished heart that is cleansed from dead works. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with unblemished joy, to God our Savior who alone is wise, be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and forever. Amen. An unblemished heart is the good and wise heart in which dwell two great witnesses, two great lights that stand before God of all the earth in the dignity of Thumim, in the format of the teaching of Christ, in the dignity of Urim, in the face of the Holy Spirit, who uncovers in our heart the mystery of Thumim that is contained in the truth of the teaching of Christ. For God gives wisdom and knowledge and joy to a man who is good in his sight 
but to the sinner he gives the work of gathering and collecting, that he may give to him who is good before God. This also is vanity and grasping for the wind. Ecclesiastes chapter 2, verse 26. You see, a person who is good, good is called a person when he has cleansed his conscience from dead works. His heart has become good, his soil has become good, and in his good soil he gives a seed, wisdom, and knowledge, and joy, which a person grows into a fruit. And to a sinner, he gives the work of gathering and collecting. He gathers and collects uh, for the dark day, and he won't be able to then use it. So that may, he may give to him who is good before God. Because soon will come the time, soon will come the time when people won't be able to collect that which they are collecting. All of this is going to be taken from them. There will be a decimal technology and money will be in numbers and decimals and it will be in a kind of capsule, a chip that is going to be placed in a person's hand. And I will tell you that this is not going to be across the whole earth. This is only going to be on the territory of the former Roman Empire, there will the, where the Antichrist will reign. And therefore, the Russians, this northern country that is called to do something to collaborate with God, God is going to do something through this country. They will never accept they will never accept this dimension of these riches. They have their own currency. China won't accept this uh, this new way of currency. This will only be necessary for the democratic Europe. This is so that you understand. Or for the Europe of that time. And these capsules are not the mark of the beast. This is just going to be the financial system. You are placed in this, you have it placed in your capsule, all your money. At any time, the government can take from this capsule, and now you can't not pay a tax. You can't not pay it. It's just automatically going to be taken from you. And if they want to, they'll take everything. And if they want to, you'll say, well, I wanted to buy this, and I wasn't given it. And they'll say, well, because there is, a, you have been punished for this and that. Just like right now, the West is punishing many countries by closing their accounts. I want to show that this won't always be, but a person who is good in his sight, he will give wisdom, and all that they had gathered, God will give to the good in the face of God. And according to Scripture, the Church of God, that part of the Church of God that is going to be clothed in imperishable bodies, God will give to them. They will collect and gather and collect, but because they don't have, they can simply collect and not use it, and to correctly use it, they don't, they don't know how to. Then in this manner, God will give this all to the wise. We together more than once have paid attention to one regularity, that whenever scripture puts together and connects with the preposition and, any characteristics, properties, and virtues inherent in God, then every time the dignity that stands in front is always and undoubtedly a kind of source that will contain in itself and from which subsequent virtues will flow. And therefore, the wisdom that comes from God always and undeniably gives supernatural knowledge. In supernatural knowledge that comes from the wisdom of God always possesses and carries in itself the triumph, uh, triumph of unearthly joy. And therefore, the presence of unblemished joy is always checked by the presence of knowledge emanating from the revelations of Urim, revealing the secret of the meme imprinted in our heart. Amen. Let us bow, bend our knees, and to whom this is impossible, their heads in prayer. And we will thank God for that word that we were able to have today. To hear and to have it today that we can take it and use it. This, These are our riches. All of those who desire to challenge sin, the chains of slavery, the bondage, you can be freed from these chains. We ask you to come out here on the altar and we will pray for you. And it doesn't matter what need you may have. If you have the need for healing, come out here as well. It is likely that God will not just lift you up above your illnesses, but will deliver you from your illnesses. 
but you must give God the decision to do this. God Himself will choose. You will simply come out here and present yourselves to God. If someone has a sin that has not been confessed, make the decision to leave it. Someone has resentment, make the decision to forgive. If you have offended someone, make the decision to ask for forgiveness. And with this decision, come out to the altar, and then God will be on your side. Amen. Let us pray. pray with your prayer and I will ask you to deeply believe that God is for you he is not against you he loves you with his whole heart he desires to heal you from all physical illnesses he despises them he wants to heal the wound of your heart he wants to destroy the chains of sin and to make you free he sees your pain your readiness and your desire to become free your eyes closed this is an element of a mystery room your hands raised to the heavens a sign that your hands are without wrath and doubt play along with me heavenly father in the name of jesus christ i come to you you are my god you are my trust you are my joy you are my healing you are my reward you are my riches you are my inheritance i love you despite the fact that i am bound by sin may the chains of sin be destroyed may i be freed from all kinds of illnesses I open my heart I accept your word the word of forgiveness of my sins and the word of healing for my illnesses and right now before heaven and earth I want to proclaim that according to your word I am washed I am cleansed I am healed, I am restored, I am justified, I am saved. Your sins are forgiven and your transgressions in the name of Jesus Christ. May the Lord bless you. May He come down upon you with His holy countenance and may, have, may He have mercy upon you, may He give you peace. May around you fall thousands and tens of thousands and not draw near you. May all of these promises come upon you and your descendants and may they be fulfilled upon you and let all the nations say amen may the Lord affirm may he affirm that promise that you have accepted today the promise of the blotting out 
of your sins before his countenance, the promise of healing from all kinds of illnesses, the promise of the destruction of the power of death in our body, the promise of the erection of the power of imperishability in our body. Carry this in your heart, ponder upon it, speak of it with one another, praise God in prayer for this, speak of this, the more and the more often you speak of this and remember this, it is going to grow in such strength and power and it will grasp and it will have such joy in you that no fear can come upon that exists in this world. Considering that our time has come to an end, let us proclaim our unchanging manifest. Now to him who is able to keep us from stumbling and to present us before the presence of his glory in unblemished joy, to God, our Savior, who alone is wise, be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and forever. Amen.